Hey everybody, I am Matthew Miller, the Fedora project leader, and this is a Fedora Council video meeting. So in Fedora, we try not to drive all of our business through meetings because meetings are terrible, but it turns out you actually need meetings to make things work. So as a compromise, we do meetings. Uh, yeah, uh, that's how that works. Um, most of the meetings are actually chat based. They're on our matrix chat every week or so. But once a month, we do a video call to do kind of a high bandwidth conversation about something interesting um, going on in the project, hopefully something that's going well, not something that's going wrong, um, something somebody has done or is doing and um, kind of have a conversation about that and show something off. So Today, we are talking about licensing, uh, which uh, is an important topic for Fedora since everything is all open source in our project, free and open source software. Uh, we kind of need to know how it's licensed and keep track of that. And so uh, we recently went through a big change in how we do that. So we have uh, David Cantrell, uh, who is a member of the Fedora Council, but also worked a lot on this, uh, Miroslav Succi, and Jelaine Lovejoy and Richard Fontana here to talk about this um, with, I guess David says, a tag team sort of presentation. So with that, um, I will turn it over to you. Um, do you want us to, people with questions, to jump in during the presentation or would you like us to let you do your dog and pony show? Yeah, so so the slides uh, probably won't take that long. I would prefer if we can get through these slides and then do a, a larger Q&A at the end. Uh, the other reason I ask for that is I, I have to drop exactly uh, uh, at 11 because I have another meeting. So um, if, if we can do that, if everyone's cool with that. Um, that sounds good to me. Um, OK. All right, now let me present the window here. Okay. okay. Yeah, yeah. Yep, looking good. Okay. Okay. This is Fedora's adoption of SPDX license and, sp and sp uh, expressions. Sorry. Um, yes, this is a, a very uh, interesting topic. Um, there, there's a lot to it. It sounds really simple, um, but uh, let's get into it. Uh, first off, who are we? I'm not going to go in this order. Uh, I'm going to call on people. So uh, as Matthew said, uh, I'm David Cantrell. I work on the software management team. So I work on RPM and DNF and things adjacent to that. Uh, I'm a member of FESCO and on the Fedora Council. Um, Jelaine. Hi, I'm Jelaine Lovejoy. I'm a product counsel at Red Hat. Um, I've also worked on the SBX legal team pretty much since the beginning of SBX and kind of always kept an eye on what Fedora was doing since the Fedora license list was a big influence um, for, for SBX at the very beginning, especially. And I've worked on other sort of open source legal type uh, community issues over my career. Miroslav? My name is Miroslav Suchy. I'm manager uh, in Packet and CPT team where we try to ease the package maintenance. And as a side job uh, slash volunteering, I'm a package maintainer of few packages in Fedora. And related to this change, I'm maintainer of Fedora license data uh, package in Fedora and license validate uh, package. And Richard? Hi, I'm Richard Fontana. Uh, I'm a lawyer at Red Hat. Uh, I am on what's now called the technology and open source legal team. And uh, I've done work mainly around open source legal issues for a long time now. Uh, been at Red Hat for a long time. Actually have worked, uh, provided advice around Fedora related legal issues. Actually, even before I got to Red Hat, which is an interesting fun fact. Um, so I got to Red Hat in 2008, but that's that's me. Okay, thank you. Um, and I, I, before we keep going, I just want to point out that uh, this, to me, this project, we've we've been working on this for 
um, a couple of years now. And it is a successful community project in Fedora that involves not just engineering, but also uh, people from Red Hat Legal. And uh, I think this is a first for Fedora uh, to have this level of involvement. And I, I think it's, uh, it's worked out really well. Uh, so with that, uh, I mentioned SPDX. So I wanna ask Jelaine to kind of give us a, a little bit of information about SPDX. Yeah, so hopefully um, most of you have heard of SPX before, but if you haven't or if you're not entirely sure what it is, um, it stands for the Software Package Data Exchange. Um, obviously, SPX is what we usually go by. And it's basically an open standard for communicating software build material information, including license information, which is, of course, what we're talking about here, um, as well as other information. So think about it as like a language, right? Um, in the software supply chain, um, people often want to know what the software is made of, and they ask for that in various forms, and um, having various forms in your supply chain is not a very um, efficient thing. So SBX was created with the idea of, like, let's communicate this information in a standard way and define that, and that'll make everything more efficient. Now, you may have heard about um, software build materials a lot in the news the last couple of years, especially since the U.S. government is now requiring them. However, this is not new. SBX has been around since 2010. People have been asking for this information since then. It's just gotten a lot more um, headlines, I guess you'd say, in the last couple of years. Um, SPX, the specification, um, just a, a little side note, is it's, it's quite a lengthy document with a lot of information in it. And um, there's a 3.0 coming out, which will be a bit more modular to accommodate sort of different use cases by way of profiles. So, for example, if you're interested in provenance, but you don't care so much about licensing or so forth and so on. It became a standard, um, an ISO standard in September 2021. But the thing that we sort of care about most here is a sort of a subset of the bigger project. Um, and that is the SPX license list, which um, is not simply a list, as I always say, although that's what everybody thinks of it. And obviously that's what it's called. But there are, um, if you go to the website, there's a list of licenses and you see the names and most importantly, the license IDs. But the sort of um, work around that to make that a reliable way to identify licenses and exceptions is that there's also some standards of how and guidelines of how things get added and there's matching guidelines to make sure that one id truly represents an identified amount of text and um and we don't have two things called the same thing for you know or or um or two things called different things that are the same vice versa um, and uh, so, yeah, so the SPX license list is often used, um, even if someone doesn't use the SPX specification, um, which is sort of what we're doing here. And just as a side note, there's been a long history of involvement with um, Fedora and SPX. I look, kind of look back at the history in the course of this, and Tom Calloway was involved in the early days. And, you know, we were looking at the, the good and bad list and how things were tracked at Fedora. And, um, and then in 2014, Around that time, um, SBX legal team reviewed all of the well, all of the software Fedora good licenses and added many of them to the SBX license list. I think this is notable because um, we had added about 80 licenses at that time. The list, which is the biggest edition ever, in in one um, one uh, rev of the license list, and just last re last release of the SBX license list, I think we added about 40. Most of those um, were because of Fedora's adoption of SPX IDs. I don't think there's been another like, you know, addition of that many licenses in the entire history of the SPX license list um, that's met that. So Fedora has been an amazing contributor to the SPX license list, which is really contributing to the the, the bigger system, you know, ecosystem, if you, if you want to call it that, of being able to identify uh, licenses and track them. All right. Thank you. Um, so I'm, I'm a package maintainer. Miroslav is a package maintainer in Fedora. And I'm pretty sure that we already have license information in the packages. So I like, why are we doing this? Richard, can, can you tell me why we're doing this? <laughs> well, yeah, I think um, we probably all have somewhat different perspectives on this. Like for me, um, SPDX expression so not just the identifiers that are in the spdx license list but the sort of larger system of spdx expressions which uh, are, are uh, as jelaine said a language which you can use um for representing any sort of license information um 
th this enables um, uh, the advantage that I see is it enables a kind of um, well-defined, uh, you know, highly precise way of describing the licenses that apply to um, the various parts of, of a package, and that um, that in itself, like that that degree of um, accuracy and completeness of information is sort of to me inherently valuable because otherwise um you know you you either have kind of inaccurate information or or information that is like sort of too fuzzy and and you know isn't going to mean the same thing from package to package different conventions from package to package um spdx uh, provides a way to um to have a uniform way of describing a lot, the, in a very precise way, um, the licenses that apply to all the packages and, and products. So if you think that license description is, is valuable at all, and, and we do, um, SPDX is really the, the best system that we have right now for, um, for doing that. I would just add, I think, you know, uh, the, the sort of stating the obvious that the reason this is important, obviously, is if you know, we want to be able to reuse code and collaborate and open source license enable that, right? So the license, you know, does matter. I know sometimes developers might think otherwise, but that's what kind of helps create the framework for, for all the things we do, especially in Fedora. And one thing that, you know, I think Rich and I have debated sort of is, is this important to Fedora package maintainers or Fedora contributors or not? But, but it's something I think that you should be aware of is if you aren't if you know if you're creating open source software and you're not clear about your license it you know and you don't make it sort of easy for someone to know what that license is it creates a lot of churn downstream because people who are redistributing especially if it's in products are going to they really want you know they want to make sure they know what licenses they are dealing with and so there's a lot of time spent and energy on sort of unraveling license information and so um, you know i think um, there's almost a whole business around that. I think it's a better use of time to just let's make it the information better upstream and then there's less time spent downstream instead of everybody redoing that work downstream. So I think it is important. It just makes it easier for everybody, however they're using the code um, once it's created. Okay, well, th this is good because like as an engineer, I definitely like things to be correct and accurate. <laughs> if I'm telling someone that something that I am offering them is open source or free software or both. I definitely want to know that they understand that and that the the licensing information is correct. So this is this is good. Fedora has an opportunity to uh, participate in this uh, existing standard, uh, at, you know, as a community member, um, and we get to sort of ensure that everything that we have in Fedora is uh, represented correctly or or, or uh, advertises the correct licensing information but <laughs> also as a package maintainer um, naturally we get a little bit of pushback we have a well-established uh, system that um, well I, I use the term established loosely um, because it was mostly the work of Tom Calloway and uh, there wasn't a clear process to get information on there it was basically you know have have a discussion with whoever wanted to have the discussion and then agree on a short name and the the objective seemed to be focused around what short abbreviation were we going to give the license not really are these the same thing are they different licenses are they actually things we can ship it was focused more on the the technical aspect um, and we had no clear owner of this data um, and it was duplicated in in multiple places uh, we just get you know it, it, we we had grown past what it could provide us so with all that what have we done all right Here's the, the big reveal, it's text, surprise. So we have Fedora legal resources, documentation on docs.fedoraproject.org. This is this was lacking, missing, it was inconsistent. We have clear processes for everything now. Uh, it, and it's on GitLab, so if you see mistakes or you want to add something or information about a tool, please send a merge request. 
Fedora license data. This is what used to be those those big license lists on the on the Fedora wiki. We now have this managed as a project uh, in GitLab, and it releases as a package. So the package is installed, so our tools can read it. But it also gets published to the docs site, which is quite nice. Um, I'll kind of go uh, clockwise here. Contributions to SPDX. As we review packages and licenses here, we are contributing new licenses or changes to matching rules back to SPDX. Uh, Fedora has a lot of software, a lot of open source software, a lot of free software. Um, there, there are changes that we can contribute back and that's been going well. Uh, and uh, it's, it's nice to see that happening. And then the big part of this project um, is obviously the migration to the expressions in the spec files. Uh, this, this is obviously complicated and we've broken it down into a number of different phases. I, I just want to add, I think um, just as a sort of a timeline and when I joined Red Hat in February of 2021, um, I think the the discussion about the moving the data off the wiki had was already, you know, had predated sort of me. And of course, I had been talking to Tom and Richard, I don't know, for over a decade, I think we figured out about Fedora adopting SPX expressions. I think the focus was on sort of those two, those two buckets um, and, the, and uh, across from each other on the slide. Um, the documentation piece, I think, you know, we realized that the wiki is getting old and everything should be moved to docs. And so um, that turned out to be a much bigger project than, you know, we didn't really count in the beginning and then, you know, sort of its own project to, to sort of revise and update all of that. So, so I think all of this, you know, is a bit more work than we um, anticipated. You think, oh, we'll just, like, you know, we'll just switch to SPX identifiers. Like how hard can yeah. you stuff to a, to a GitLab to a repo? And, and then I would just add from the SPX perspective, I mean, besides I mentioned all those new licenses that were added, um, you know, I know, I know Richard and Times and others have said, you know, well, the SPX license list is not, there's not enough licenses on there. It doesn't reflect, you know, say what's in an entire Linux distro. I mean, the Linux kernel um, adopted SPX IDs. And so that, you know, definitely added, but it's, it's as long as anyone, you know, there's as many licenses on it as people ask for there to be. So, I mean, other than when the SPX legal went out and and of course the initial release and then later went and tried to pull stuff off of Fedora. I mean, we sort of wait for someone to submit stuff. Um, so I think that Fedora's adopting SPX IDs is having this really great, you know, and sometimes challenging knockdown effect on, on SPX and, and therefore like a much wider um, range of people and community and influence, you know, beyond, um, beyond just Fedora, the Fedora community, which is, a, I think, a great, uh, well, so, you know, great thing about open source, right? Um, and, you know, that's forced SBX to kind of look at some of our processes and, and make it a little more efficient, hopefully, and, and uh, you know, that work will continue. Yeah, I, I would just want to emphasize also that this is kind of a, this is a project that's larger than just the SPDX piece of it. Uh, we've been improving, so the doc, we've been improving all the legal documentation by kind of creating this new documentation. We're, we're making it sort of clearer and um, uh, updating it and, and kind of rationalizing it. So there were certain contradictions in the way uh, things were laid out on the wiki in terms of documentation uh, around not just like license names, uh, but, but all sorts of other related uh, Fedora legal issues. Um, also, the, the use of GitLab um, just by itself has enabled a kind of um, collaborativeness and transparency, a, a sort of way of working that is, I think, much better than, you know, the, the past approach of, uh, you know, kind of having a mailing list and then kind of having some back channel email discussions between me and Tom Calloway. Uh, this, is, this is a much uh, uh, improved approach, I think, to just kind of getting this, this kind of work done. Yeah, yeah. That, that's a good point. It's really nice because um, people can see how how the stuff plays out, how the process works, uh, and they can get involved that way. Um, I, I think, like you know, just to build off of Richard's point about the documentation. I, I mean, I I don't know of this happening yet, but I think it's very foreseeable that 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 
articulation of of the license standards for Fedora and and all of the all of that information in that documentation, it's very much re, you know could be reusable and other for other projects. Um, so it would be interesting to see if if people uh, that's true follow from that. Yeah. So with all that uh, <laughs> and that that large overview, um, we did it. We're done. Uh, everything's finished. Um, well, the easy part was. So now we actually get to the the business end of what we're doing, and and that's going back to the migration here. So this is this is the part where we've been planning um, some hackfest. We will be sending out uh, notices about that. But what this what what we have found and what we've agreed on approach wise is there's a subset of packages where the license identifier uh, that's in there is uh, simple. Maybe it's just GPL v2 plus uh, the the old Fedora license, and the software is well understood. Um, it, it's something major and we, we know what it is. So there's there's some things like that that we can generate an SPDX expression for, but really what this comes down to and to get this information really correct is manual inspection of, of source code, um, either either by a scanning tool or reading it or something like that. And, and that is a thing that, that we need to incorporate into the general package maintenance process, the new package process, but we do understand that this is kind of new a kind of, you know it's a change from from how we have done things so that's why we want to do these these hack fest days to uh, show people you know kind of the process that that you can use to to go through this um, sorry now revised policy here Richard I wanted you to touch on these two main objectives here for uh, package maintainers here. Yeah, so this is this is not conceptually new. This is the same thing that we did in the past before we were using um, SPDX expressions to represent licenses. But uh, this is kind of how we are using SPDX expressions now. So there are two parts of this. There's first, as we encounter um, new licenses in Fedora packages, um, that's you know source code of Fedora packages. Um, you know, if they're not already on our uh, in Fedora license data and already classified, we we undergo a review um, based on GitLab issues and determine, you know, did they do they fit into one of our approval categories or are they um, are we going to treat them as disallowed? And in some cases, we actually have licenses that are disallowed, um, but we grant certain limited exceptions to their to their use. Um, and the way we kind of conceptualize what a license is in that phase is really from the start sort of, uh, it, we may not have an SPDX um, expression because there may not be an identifier yet to represent it, but we're always thinking, how would this fit in with the SPDX model of what a license is? So that's that's one piece of it. And then if something is, is um, um, approved, then the normal process is, um, with some exceptions, is to kind of uh, submit an issue to the SPDX project to add the license as a license identifier to the SPDX license. So that's that's one part, and then the other part is once you do have um, an SPDX expression, um, you um, you know we have this practice in Fedora of representing uh, license metadata in RPM spec files, and um, so we created some updated documentation about this. But you know, in addition to um, you know the fact that we're now using SPDX expressions in the license field in the spec file. We also have um, kind of clearer documentation on on um, how you sort of figure out what that representation should be, and so the the, um, the sort of summary of the rule we have, which is which is not different from the past rule under the Tom Calloway system, really, um, but it's more clearly sort of set out is that that the license field is supposed to be a simple enumeration of all the um, licenses covering code and content and you know anything that's in the uh, binary RPMs that are shipped by Fedora. So there, there are going to be some packages that will have some material covered by a license, a uh, particular license in, um, uh, in the source code where that particular license won't be represented in the license field. That's just because of this policy we have uh, that Fedora has, as far as I know, had for at least 15 years of um, attempting to only have the license field represent what's in uh, a given binary RPM. Um, so that's the two 
pieces of how we are using SPDX expressions in this um, you know new system. Yes, thank you. So that that's a thing that I keep trying to to communicate consistently to package maintainers is that the expression that you're generating is for code and content in the binary RPMs. And yes, that has been sort of an understood policy, but I I don't remember where it was written down. And I know that some people thought otherwise and would add other licenses to the license tag. So this is important when we have maintainers using scanning tools because it's going to pick up, for example, um, autoconf and automake template files, which are littered with GPL boilerplate, but that's stuff for building the software that doesn't actually ship in the binary RPM in some instances. So we just need to work with package maintainers so they understand, you know, how to look at the scanning tool output and, and um, things like that. Um, so there's a lot of work ahead of us and Miroslav has been uh, posting progress reports for us and sort of giving us an idea of where we stand. So Miroslav. Yep. Uh, so I try to uh, send every two weeks uh, to federal developer mailing list and legal mailing list uh, status where we are. Uh, I create a burn down chart uh, out of this data, which can give us some estimate where when we uh, are going to be finished. Uh, because we are at early stage, it always go one month left, one month right. So this. It oscillate around the summer 2024 right now, and we are right now in 34% uh, uh, done, uh, so two thirds uh, are ahead of us. Uh, is uh, like uh, how many? 20,000, less than 20,000 packages. Uh, uh, and. Uh, yeah, we need the help uh, of, of other people. Like uh, we can't do that manually. Uh, like if if our team, uh, like David, Richard, and Gillette would work on that solely alone, that would probably be twenty years uh, uh, estimated time. Uh, so we need the help of the maintainers. And I'm sending these reports in uh, in a silly hope that. Uh, other maintainers reading these statistics will uh, like say, okay, I, I'm, I see this mail with SPD statistics for 25 times already. So maybe, maybe I, I can read it. And uh, usually at the bottom, there's some hints of what you can do uh, that your package appears in the, in, in the, in the done uh, part. Uh, if you are curious, uh, there is a link for the scripts, which actually uh, check the data, but uh, it's very simple. It uh, checks the spec file change log and then the disk git change log. Uh, uh, if there is uh, SPD uh, string, uh, and then I consider it done. And then, but it's followed up by, by some heuristic, uh, whether the license is valid as, as old and new one. Uh, and based on that, I, I do some recommendation. That's all. Yeah. It's great. Thank you. And and I wanted to add to that, that I have noticed uh, posting those, those reports uh, every two weeks, I have seen package maintainers go and take that step and and convert their packages on their own um you know not waiting for us to to do a hack fest or or something you know that we would start so it is i think it is helping but there is a lot of work to do um so uh looking forward here jelaine what what do we have what do we have uh down the road oh you're muted I think so. That's a great segue to how do we, you know, update, help package maintainers update the packages more efficiently. Um, one thing, if anyone's wondering this and was talked about a lot early on was, well, can't we just do like a, I'm going to call it a find and replace, like, well, we have this mapping of the old IDs, the new ones, you know, can't we just sort of automate that in some way? And that's not, um, that's not doable on scale for a number of reasons. One of which is that the Fedora, um, the Fedora IDs had a concept of sort of category IDs. So like MIT was used to uh, across a lot of different license texts and that's not how SBX works. Um, and then there's, there's, so there's quite a few like that, that, that represent, you know, a big chunk of, um, 
of the packages. And um, so that's sort of, it's impossible for those. Those need to be sort of manually inspected. Um, and then there's also a lot of, uh, some of us believe that while, you know, sometimes package maintainers don't update or look at the license except the first, you know, the very initial uh, review. And, you know, this might be a good opportunity to sort of double check things. And otherwise, you know, are we just sort of re, um, regenerating, the, you know, wrong information in a new format? You know, that, that wouldn't be good. So we've now, if it, there's a change uh, order or two that's posted on the wiki um, that we thought, well, let's maybe, uh, kind of do something in the interim where we'll map some IDs that we feel reasonably confident that are sort of a one-to-one -one relationship to SBX and um, create uh, uh, merge requests on the, or issues on those. So the package maintainer has a chance to actually review them and sort of a little bit of another nudge in addition to Miroslav's bot, um, every other week kind of reminder. We haven't done this yet. That's gonna, you know, it's sort of coming later. Um, but in the meantime, we have a Hackfest planned for April 26th. Um, we need to announce that still. That'll focus on the ELN packages. That'll sort of do some training on how um, David will do a demo on how to how how to kind of review a package. So you know, and then anyone can attend and review their packages during the Hackfest, and you know, we'll have people there to help out. So I think that'll be great. If that goes well, maybe we'll do another one. Um, I'm going to let Richard you talk about the the Pelk data. Um, I think I've already mentioned the sort of influence on SBX and, and um, impact on other, you know, the potential for impact on other communities, um, which, you know, is to be seen. And we've been trying to improve the documentation, like, ongoing, like, as people have questions, especially on the updating packages, we've been, you know, and it's something's not clear. Um, Richard and I have been trying to just stay on top of that. So it's, it's not, it doesn't get stale. Yeah, so about the the PELC data. So, so PELC is this uh, system, you could say a sort of legacy system we have inside Red Hat um, for, um, among other things, it sort of makes use of license scanning and it sort of duplicates a lot of what this Fedora activity does. It's mainly been sort of oriented towards Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Um, and uh, we had this goal, uh, you know, of, of kind of taking the license approval and disapproval data we've been kind of developing internally through this PELC tool and kind of like merging it with the, the Fedora data. I think as time goes on, that actually is getting less and less significant because the, um, <laughs> as, as we sort of um, have migrated to using SPDX identifiers and having this new process, we're actually getting uh, that extra data that was uh, you know, gleaned from analyzing RHEL internally at Red Hat through this um, public process we have in Fedora. So I think increasingly, um, it may be less important to worry about merging that that sort of data, but that's still sort of a, a goal from the Red Hat side that we want to have um, uh, ideally, ultimately, the single list. We we speak of a single source of truth of uh, you know what from Red Hat's perspective um, are approved and unapproved licenses based on you know what Fedora policy is, and then that will then you know Red Hat will use that as the license policy across all of its you know portfolio of Community projects and 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 downstream commercial products and so forth. So um, so that's that's an ongoing thing, but I think it's sort of in a sense taking care of itself through the progress we've made with Fedora. All right, thank you. Um, everyone can see uh, what a simple task uh, software licensing is. Uh, hopefully, this answered some questions. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for joining this call. I'd like to thank everyone on uh, the Fedora SPDX team for helping with this presentation. I'm going to stop sharing my slides now, and we can move to, uh, I guess, uh, Q&A. Oh, oh, my voice is not working. Sorry. Um, yeah, thank you, everybody. This was really great. Um, I don't think I have any questions because it was so thorough. I don't know if that's good or also <laughs> I've been following this all along. So uh, <laughs> yes. Does anyone well, else have a question? Have any questions, Matthew? <laughs> What's that? I said I would hope you don't have any questions. Uh, right. Yeah, well, <laughs> but I should be able to like you know um, ask some leading questions or something. That's a. <laughs> Yeah, I should have sent you some before the call. <laughs> um, that's one thing I want to say is uh, um, 
David, I think you were a little bit harsh on the older process. I think there was, um, uh, it wasn't just talking about like what the short ID should be. There were a lot of interesting um, conversations about. Yeah, so, um, so I, I should clarify with that. That, that was not my intent. Um, I, I feel like we, we kind of had, we had two sides to that process and it was separate groups that didn't always necessarily know the other was talking. So from my point of view as a package maintainer, I would ask about something and then I was just waiting to be told what the short ID would be, um, you know, and, and so I, I didn't know what the rest of the involvement was. The process we have now moving to SPDX, everything is all tied together. You can see the, the whole workflow, workflow, um, uh, through the entire process, which I think is better, but I did not mean to uh, uh, be too harsh on on the old the old system. Yeah, in the in the old system, we actually had, um, as far as I was involved in it, going back to two thousand eight, actually two thousand seven, before I was at Red Hat. Um, Tom Calloway was was exploring like you know issues of boss license policy at a an extremely deep and intricate level and i got involved in that and and so there are all these discussions happening largely between me and tom calloway behind the scenes but that was not public and i think we're i, I think we're still sort of guilty uh you know in, in this new system of, of not being as transparent about this thinking process part of it as, as we could be but i'm trying to like when in dealing with issues on on the gitlab i'm trying to do a better job of kind of uh publicly explain like the reasoning process and and we want to this is also why we have better documentation so so one thing we didn't have in the old system is any attempt to have kind of like a distilled um explanation of what fedora license policy is for the most part um we, we now have a uh in a sort of uh, a more elaborate explanation of like what what is our policy around documentation licenses what is our po policy around font licenses in, in a way that we didn't quite have before. I mean, it, it wasn't that bad before, but 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 it, but I think it's better now. And I'll just add to that. I mean, I, it was very it, really interesting that whole process of what Richard described of looking at the documentation, updating it. Because even as someone who's not like intimately involved in Fedora, but have been sort of watching and was really familiar with the list and you know knew Tom Callaway, I you know I thought I was like, oh well, of course it's written down. Like, don't we all know what it is? And so it was really interesting. I mean, I think it's a it speaks to um, Tom's influence that like you you kind of knew you kind of knew what it was the the policy of what was allowed um, if you watched the Fedora legal mailing list and you know sort of like we all got to be a little bit inside Tom's head, but um, you never want to have like a you know a single point of failure with one person holding all that in their head and everyone just assuming they know what it is. I mean, you really need to have it documented. And, and I think that's a common problem in open source projects. <laughs> it's sort of reflected a lot on my role in SPX in the same way, when you have someone who's just been involved for a long time and it takes a lot of discipline to kind of write it all to write it all down because, you know, it's like, as Richard said, even he's had kind of, you know, having to really think about doing that even now that we have a more transparent process in GitLab. So I think it's a common, um, sort of challenge. And you know, of course, documentation is usually always like lagging. Right. But, uh, you know, it's it's good to to refresh that and think about that again. And and uh, you know, we've done the same thing at SBX. Our documentation is not great. And and when I start thinking about okay, a package maintainer who's never done you know dealt with SBX could come in and like, can I point them to something that like clearly and consistently explains what the process is? You know, um, that's it's always a good uh, good improvement. I I want to also clarify for anybody watching. Tom Calloway is not dead. He's still around. We sound yeah. like we're like we're giving eulogies here. Um, now he's just uh, went to work for Amazon on uh, open source community stuff there, and is very busy. He is still uh, active in Fedora and yeah. maintains like 300 packages or something. As yes. Well. Yeah. So, and, and um, thank you, Matthew. I, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think I was actually going to say something well along those lines, but that's more extreme than I was thinking. <laughs> that I think we were all a bit self-conscious of like, oh gosh, you know, what's what's Tom thinking during all this? Like, are we, un, you know, is he like, and so um, fortunately, David and I did a presentation uh, about this whole process on early days and at All Things Open in Raleigh in October and yeah. Tom was there and, and we all went and had a beer, which was lovely. And, and, you know, and he was very supportive. And of course, you know, he was Tom, but we had a nice time chatting and, 
joking about the whole the whole thing. So yeah, not hating us for for doing this. <laughs> no, in fact, I I think there were a few instances where you said it it it, it seems like you're you're solving a lot of long-standing concerns and questions mm -hmm. I had, you know, that were just kind of like back burner issues, um, which, which was, which was nice. But yes, he was very supportive of everything we were doing and, and moving Fedora in this direction. Um, one thing that, that, uh, I didn't mention in the presentation, uh, but you'll see if you go to the legal documentation site is, um, uh, we, we did not carry over, um, there was the, compatibility table for GPL licenses. Um, and yeah, Richard. Um, and that that is a question that comes up from time to time from package maintainers, because that was kind of a long established um, thing that we had in, uh, had in Fedora. And our, our conversations with it have, have basically uh, been around trying to figure out where that came from, you know, where that sort of, you know, concept and, and maybe fear of using something licensed that wasn't GPL compatible, where did it come from? Um, and there, and that led down this, this whole path of, I was digging up old emails about uh, questions about uh, GPL, GPL V3 and V2 uh, and things like that. And Richard, I can't remember if we ever actually conclusively found where where this started. We just sort of maybe theorized that it was around the drafting of GPL V3 and that the, the notion of license compatibility was a concern. But now going forward, is that something that that we need to think about in the same way? Oh yeah, I mean, I, I don't, I, I I don't know how far back um, Tom Callaway was was making an attempt to to um, uh, sort of notate judgments about GPL compatibility. It may have actually been earlier than GPL v three. The issue is. Um, you know, so Florian Weimer said on, I think, the Fedora legal list in a thread about this, you know, what would we actually do? Someone was saying, like, why'd you get rid of this information about GPL compatibility? By the way, there's there's also issues of compatibility with non-GPL licenses that Fedora never made any attempt to, to provide, like, documented information on. And Florian said, um, well, what, what did Fedora ever do with this information? And I think that that's, that's a fair uh, comment. I don't think Fedora in general did use this information. Um, no, I, I think. I, I think we did sometimes. Like there's some things with like read line in particular. I remember people being very careful about that um, and making sure that you know if you had something that wasn't GPL compatible, you didn't link it with read line that that sort of thing. I think um, I, I at least used it used it for that kind of thing. Uh, I don't know. Um, but uh, I don't think we were consistent. I think that's fair to say. We weren't consistent. And it was, like you said, like mostly a self-policing thing. Like we saw we saw this chart, we have to follow these rules kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, the, the uh, this is actually, my views on this topic were shaped in part by working um, on, on these Fedora issues. That basically what we found was when license compatibility issues came up, we would always find a reason to explain why uh, the general rule didn't apply in a given case. So there's the exception always canceled out the rule. And, and I think that we found that there was a big divide between sort of um, FOSS community, I don't know how to describe it, like FOSS community doctrine sort of like removed from practical day-to-day -day issues of software development and what, what um, software developers what project maintainers actually do in 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 terms of like like what what um, code under what licenses they introduce into their projects or what licenses of dependencies they they use there was a big divide and 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 um, this is a whole kind of big topic I've been obsessed with for for a while as Jelaine knows but um, I I think the picture that Fedora was giving and in, in kind of maintaining that information was not actually helpful because because in in the typical case we would actually determine that there was no license incompatibility problem at all. And we still say, um, we actually have some documentation about this now because someone raised this on the Fedora legal list. 
um, we, we, we explain that this is a very confusing doctrine, but if you, if you are concerned about license compatibility issue, uh, you know, submit a Bugzilla issue and we'll look into it. And um, I think that may have happened once since we published that. And and the the reason I brought that up is I wanted to reiterate on the um, on the license tag in the spec file is enumerating all of the the license identifiers that appear in code that goes into code and content that goes into the binary RPMs. What we didn't mention in the presentation was that there's no effective license computation. We don't right. like package maintainers should not be saying like, oh, well, that's some BSD code and that's some GPL code. That means my package is GPL. They're not package maintainers. That's a, that's are, a big are, change. That is a big change. Well, because uh, we, I don't, I, I don't kind of agree with the change. But, 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 but it's, it's, it's a change it's, from, from the, the practice of a lot of package maintainers. It, that, that, is, that is accurate, yeah. So there was an yes. inconsistent, one of the reasons why we have this rule. So I would contend that it was the, the old rule as I understood it. Maybe I misunderstood at least how some people were interpreting it. Uh, I think that the documentation, some of the documentation expressed this as the old rule. Um, the problem is that people, like package maintainers were applying it inconsistently from package to package. And so we had some people applying this effective license rule. Each person was basically interpreting the GPL on their own. And so the goal of having kind of a uniform uh, sort of system that is going to be consistent from package to package was not being realized. And that's one of the advantages of moving to SPDX is that you, you can have the potential of having a uniform standard system of license description. But if everyone is, in, is kind of interpreting um, like licensing uh, in ways that sort of allow you to kind of remove certain licenses in different ways from package to package, that advantage is, is going to be, uh, you know, it's going to be lost. So, yeah. 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 So one of the things that's come up uh, kind of related to that, um, generally, if there was any other license whatsoever, um, anything that said public domain dedication yeah. or this is in the public domain, we would just ignore forever because, hey, that's not that doesn't matter. Um, so now we are um, looking at identifying those public domain statements because each of those actually is a license or often is a license or a licensee statement or something in its own way at least needs to be looked at like what what is it is this meant to does it acting like a license i don't know so when you see something like that um we should bring that um as a, so as it's, a it's, possible it's, thing as well so that I can get looked at by the people who know what they're talking about jelaine was making faces at my statements no so, no i mean I well, it's, it's, I, I this is another case point. where it, it's really not a change um, so there, there is, there was a Callaway public domain, not an identifier, perhaps yeah. a name. Maybe it wasn't used consistently right. from package to package, just like the, the, as we were just talking about. Generally, if something had was GPL with some public domain things in there, no one would bother to list GPL and public domain. They would just list that's GPL. Probably, I can't that's probably yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's that. Yeah. But there's but we a have, lot of it, packages that do use that public domain um, kind of old name, and I think. What you probably said without maybe even realizing it, Matthew, is like there's a, there. I've noticed in my many years of like dealing with looking at license and license type information in source files that sometimes something sort of purports to be public domain, but it's really a license. And so you know, because of using just a kind of a short name without really describing like rules around when it was used, or you know, kind of being a little bit loose. Um, you know, those things need to be looked at because maybe they're not really a public domain dedication. Maybe there's a, it's actually a license or maybe it is. Now, <laughs> in, in an interesting kind of potentially come full circle scenario, what we have been doing is we've actually been investigating those and like, go look at it, figure out what it is and then submit it in GitLab. And we've been sort of collecting those in, a, in one text file and telling people to use um, a license ref. License ref is an SPX specification um, designation for a license that's not on, um, or license type stuff, that's not on the SPX license list um, because there's no way the license list can uh, accommodate everything that's found in software. And the reason that we did that is, and I kind of anticipated that like, we don't really know how many of these, these things we'll find and what they look like. 
And if we just submit them to SBX one, one by one, it, it doesn't really give a full picture of, of, of the scenario. So like maybe there aren't that many or maybe there's like a hundred variations of, that say kind of the same thing. And so I wanted to be able to say like, let's just kind of do, it's a little bit of a potential, you know, possibly a, um, a, a you know interim fix that we might have to go back and change later. But if we collect like, all these things that look like a public domain, you know, a simple public domain dedication was what we kind of presume it, it would have been under the Callaway system. And then we say, hey, look, SBX going through, you know, this Linux distro Fedora, we found, you know, this line, I'm actually about to send an email because now we have enough data. Like how should SBX deal with this? Because SBX has traditionally always been like a one, to, you know, one ID means one specific set of texts and, and, and there needs to be identifiable text. People have tried to, um, suggest we should have a public domain tag, but not define what that means. I'm like, that is super problematic. Like, so our not the, the license ref right now is one single license ref that goes to a thought. So if I find a dedication and can basically get that added to the collected file and not need to come up with a new license exactly. ref for each one, yeah. that seems very sensible. Yeah, and, and you know, it's possible that SPX we'll look at that and say yeah maybe we'll adopt something like that for these and there's also some like ultra we call it we have another similar thing we're doing with ultra permissive licenses where it's it's just like a, a one-liner um with no license conditions or anything um and just again we don't know how many things like that are out there and maybe svx will say you know what we are going to create like a, a <laughs> ironically a bit of a category id i mean i'm not predicting the future big, big, big caveat disclaimer. Um, but it's defined as meaning one of these defined things, right? Like there's no way, it's not helpful to just have <laughs> some undefined thing that people have to figure out what it means, right? That we like, I yeah. think, think the past and, and a lot of these things are like, I came across one that said, this is public domain, do not copyright this code, which like, what does that mean? I don't, it, it, Eng engineers shouldn't be writing statements like that. I'm I'm gonna say it's a blanket thing because it, it's uh, lawyers hard, are bad hard. at writing licenses too. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No. No one should write any of these things. Stop. Yeah. Everything's terrible. Uh, uh, we had ended up um, with that piece of software just changing it to an existing um, very permissive license that um, then everything. Uh, yeah, when well, happy to problem do is, is even when you change a license, the old the old versions probably exist with that other line. Yeah. But I mean, yeah. for, if Fedora is like going to only have the new version with a new license, I'm like, great, you know, yep. <laughs> pretend those old ones don't exist. But yeah, yeah, that's a thing Fedora gets to do. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, you're at the hour here. Um, uh, I think David had to had to leave already. Um, anybody have any final thoughts or questions here? Okay. Well, thank you again very much. This was great. Thank you for all this work and ongoing work um, and explaining it. It's very nice. Um, next month, we are having a Fedora Linux release rather than having one of these meetings. So I think we will not have a video meeting. Is that correct, Ben? Well, so we had sort of preemptively canceled it, but the release party is going to be a little later than normal. Okay. Um, so it, we might actually decide we want to do it in may and skip the june meeting so that's something for us to figure out uh later on so stay tuned to discussion.floraproject.org to find out sounds good all right goodbye everybody <laughs>